uh, we, we were wondering what the topic ought to be. In, in such groups, and at the moment, usually Ukraine is one of the main topics, or China. In other words, uh, the traditional uh, world geopolitical security topics. What I'd like to do is talk as much as you care to talk about Ukraine because it's something that I'm very active in and uh, as some of you know, my wife is 100% Ukrainian and my, my children are 50% Ukrainian, so uh, uh, I have a, also a family tie to it. But it's also the reason that I will try and weave the two together is that the crisis in the eastern part of Europe, including the Russian invasion of Ukraine, is in many ways a product, or even, a, well, a product, I would say, not a cause, but a product of the bigger developments which are going on in the world, which I really feel is something we should all be interested in, which I'll at least start talking about. But I'm, uh, I do keep up on matters in Ukraine, so if anybody has questions about that, I'd be happy to answer them also. The, the basic point that I have been, shall we say, following active in for really now 15 or more years is the fundamental changes which are going on in our world caused mostly but not entirely but caused mostly by the development of digital rapid digital communications supply chains etc cetera, etc cetera. they are changing our world as fundamentally as climate change is changing it which we have seen this summer or the other big issue that's on the front burner for both European and American governments, of course, is refugees. And so there are, there are many other things going on in the world, but they are all being affected one way or another by the digital revolution. And the, the, the digital revolution is essentially the um, adaptation of our institutions, of our infrastructure, of our businesses and also of our consciousness to the changes, the, the, the rapid changes, dramatic and, and partially revolutionary changes, which are taking place because of the steady but fairly clear progression of a diplomatic, uh, of digital structures and digital technology. Uh, in our world, and that's the thing that is, is drawing even the even the engagement in Ukraine is drawn together very much by the uh, by the the background of the uh, technological era. Uh, when did this all start? Well, the, the, usually this things like this they, they never start; they're just there, and um, you could find various um, landmarks and uh, on the way either the development of, of electronic computing, which actually was done in World War II, or the invention of the transistor, or the invention of the uh, integrated circuit. There, there are lots of places. The end of the Cold War plays a role here because all of a sudden the whole world was open for development. And uh, these new digital means were very important for the uh, structures that, that, that did this development. I, I had a consulting contract, which I worked quite hard on, for the uh, internet uh, electronics company, uh, Accenture. And one of my main projects at that time was to help Volkswagen install a totally computerized global service structure. And as you know, uh, since we're sitting probably here on the, on the land, occupied by a car dealer for many, many years. Uh, car dealers don't earn their money really on uh, selling cars, they earn their money on fixing cars. And Volkswagen has this network of 300 countries or something, and they essentially gave up the control of their network to a digital system designed by Accenture, of course, uh, because they couldn't, they couldn't uh, handle it anymore. They said, it's just too diverse, we can't sit here and with paper and pencil and run this thing. So uh, every Volkswagen dealer, including the ones here in Nashville, who you 
take your car to to get that oil change or to fix whatever has happened to it <coughs> is being managed by the, a, a global supply chain and a global digital management structure. And this is happening everywhere. If we had been meeting, say, two years ago here now, not a year, but a year, two years ago or even a year and a half ago, uh, nobody, none of us would ever have heard and uh, would ever, probably would, except for maybe uh, Mr. Monday, wouldn't, uh, had never heard of chat GBT. All of a sudden, chat GBP is on everybody's tongue. It's a uh, product or a, a instrument of uh, artificial intelligence. And um, it has led to dramatic analysis, not necessarily to the results, because chat GBT is still a pretty prim primitive structure for what's probably coming in the future. But uh, one after another, uh, people are coming out now saying, uh, uh, artificial intelligence is going to change our world completely. The head, the head of uh, IBM, uh, no, yeah, the head of IBM said he was cutting out 50,000 jobs because they could all be done by chat GBT. Uh, Microsoft has uh, jumped in full, full, full footed in this thing and has brought out a new uh, search engine which hopefully will, ch will challenge Google, but Google is doing the same thing, so who knows. In other words, the calculations, even the maps of our world, are different now than they were five years ago or 10 years ago. Because the maps of our world now are based not on geography or economics or power or soft power, in fact. They are based on the dynamics of this digital world. And in the future, the people or the nations or the companies who are successful will have understood and mastered, if you will, the fact that the dynamics of the digital world are, are the dynamics also of, of our real world, and they will um, have adjusted to them. Now, I'm going to find here the name of something. Uh, there is a company which is called. Um, I forgot the name, but it doesn't matter. There is a company which is doing some work in the world, and it has resulted in a major competition, I wouldn't call it confrontation, but competition between the United States and China. And what is this company doing? It's building an undersea cable from Singapore to Italy. Think about that. It's going to go through the Suez Canal, literally. It's going to go the Indian Ocean, Persian Gulf, up to the Suez Canal, going to go through the Suez Canal, and then it's going to end in Italy. This is something like 7,000 miles of, uh, of cable. And this is considered by the United States government to be one of the most strategic events which is going to take place in the next five or 10 years, because that cable will quadruple or quintuple, or whatever the word is, uh, the uh, the capacity for communicating between Europe and China. And that is why, I'll make a slight detour here, the war in Ukraine is so important to us. Because for the United States and for, shall we say, democratic countries around the world, making sure that this new digital world is not also a world of digital cold war is very important. We were very much ahead of everybody, we, the United States, but also Western Europe. We were very much ahead of everybody in the development of the internet, of the, of the uh, rapid f financial transfers, etc. But the Chinese are catching up very fast. And the Chinese have made very clear that the digital world that they see is a world in which digital products, digital systems, are used to keep people under control, not to make them freer. And our point of view is that it's making it freer, but there have also been some, needless to say, some effects of this which haven't exactly been what we had hoped for. Uh, much of the uh, debate on social media, for example, there are endless numbers of, if you go to uh, 
Google and look up articles on social media, you'll probably find 10,000 of them there. And psychiatrists are telling us how, how we're ruining our young generations and everything. Um, I'm from the generation which grew up in the 1950s. I was a teenager in the late 1950s. And I remember that in those years, two things were going to be the end of Western civilization. One was television, and the other was rock and roll. <laughs> it seems very tame now, but I uh, remember that, that Elvis Presley could only be shown from his head and shoulders and not lower, shall we say, on the Ed Sullivan Show, because that was considered to be so uh, lewd that it would upset the entire American society. So in other words, this is not new, but it, this is very dramatic, what's happening. The uh, last time that there was such a dramatic change in society and in the economy was in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. And not to put too fine a point on it, but the Industrial Revolution ended, or, or shall we say, evolved into two of the worst wars ever fought in the world. One of the worst economic depressions that we've ever experienced and the total upheaval of the maps of Europe in particular, but also of Asia. Our map didn't change ge geographically, but it certainly changed psychologically with Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the new, his new deal, et cetera, et cetera. So we are in another one of these revolutionary periods. There are always, it's always hard to understand where you are in a revolutionary period. Are we at the beginning, are we in the middle? Is it over? We can't tell that. Somebody 200 years from now will tell us when it began and when it ended, but we're not gonna be able to do that. But it is important to understand that it's happening and that it's changing everything. If you look at the political situation in the United States or in most countries in Western Europe, they are facing confrontation between traditionalists who don't want to change or who feel that their life is going to end if you change and people who believe in, in the change which in, in our country and in Europe is mostly in the private sector. Uh, but one of the reasons that Russia has been so aggressive and most of this is not carefully thought out, it's mostly emotional but it, emotions are very important in these issues. One of the reasons that Russia has been so active in trying to contradict what's going on is twofold. First, if you look at these new maps that I'm talking about, which contain the digital connections around the world, you will see great big fat blue lines across the Atlantic. You'll see great big fat blue lines across the Pacific. You'll see all kinds of things Google is building a new cable down to Chile, for example. Believe it or not, Google is doing it all on its own. And if you look at the map of Russia, you see nothing. Russia has missed the digital revolution. And countries around it, who are independent, who have been independent only since 1990, who were part of the Soviet Union before that, Country, these countries, who, the, who Russians, of course, wish would remain in their sphere of influence, these countries are galloping to the West. Why? Because they know this is where the future is. And uh, we are, you can see my flag on my lapel, as I mentioned, we are a uh, Ukrainian family. But my wife has been working for several years as a election monitor for the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And she was just 10 days ago in Uzbekistan, which to most of us is known for the Silk Road and all that sort of stuff, but it's a far away place, let's put it that way. And they are totally oriented towards the United States now. And, and, and to almost the same degree, but a little bit lesser degree, to Western Europe. And when she goes there, she finds a ready supply of English-speaking interpreters, of people who have lived around the world, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this world is, is at the moment dominated by the Western democracies, and it is pulling, what it is really doing, uh, is pulling the Russian Empire apart. 
and uh, it's doing it by enticing the countries on the borders of the, of the current Russia, who are mostly parts of the Imperial Russian Empire and the Soviet Union, it is enticing them to become westernized, not just Ukraine. Georgia, I have spent many, several years informally as a, as a consultant to the Georgian government. I don't do it anymore because they've gone off on a tack that I don't uh, consider to be the right one. But if you take the little country of Georgia, it doesn't even have five million people. It's about the size of the state of Maryland, which is not very large. But they have a rich culture. They fight with the Armenians, not sometimes literally, over who was the first Christian culture in Europe. And it's probably Armenia, but Georgia was a close second. And this was like in 400 AD, something like that. So they're, they're very much part of the European world, even though most Europeans wouldn't even know where they are on the map. But the Russians started this series of wars that they've been fighting, not in Ukraine, not in Armenia or Azerbaijan, but in Georgia. And to this day, Russia occupies 20% of Georgian territory. And they have, they have this very sophisticated, if you will, system. They send somebody out every couple of weeks and just move the border into Georgian territory by a not much by 100 yards, maybe 50 yards. But over the past 10 years, they have moved the border about two miles, just by stealth, just by moving the barbed wire. And uh, this, this kind of development is going to test the fortitude and the creativity of all of us. It's going to be the countries who are the most open and the most uh, amenable to the to development who profit from this. It's not necessarily a system which would, democracies will profit from only. Look at China. But at the same time, China is going through tremendous upheavals right now that be behind the scenes. And so for then if we localize it down to us here in Nashville, it will make a very big difference because of the dynamics of the world that that also your economies and your businesses are dealing with. There have been a lot of new companies coming to Nashville in the past few years, Amazon and Cisco Systems and all these kind of people. Why are they coming to Nashville? Well, it's a great place, of course, I would agree with that. But they're coming here because they need to expand into places which are also part of this digital world. And luckily, Tennessee has been very partially fortunate, but also very active in becoming part of the digital world. And uh, as you know, uh, we are the main center in the United States for the Japanese economy. And the Japanese are very active participations in the digital world. So what does that all lead up to? It leads up to that most of the terms that we use, and if I may say so, Patrick, soft power is a a term that was overtaken by events 10 years ago. It doesn't exist anymore. Soft power is, was, was a Cold War invention to basically describe the attraction of the United States. The attraction now is through digital power. And uh, the, uh, the instruments are no longer Barbie dolls, which were part of the uh, American soft power. They are those countries, those individuals, and those companies who are able to adapt to the dynamics of a world <clears throat> in which brick and mortar, like this beautiful new offices of uh, Baker Donaldson here, are increasingly not so important. And this development was, as we know, uh, made more rapid, maybe is the right word, by the COVID pandemic because people had to work from home for, for two years, basically. Now nobody wants to go back to work because it, it turned out that it was more comfortable to be at home. Yeah, but if you're at home and it's more comfortable, you don't meet people, you don't interact with people, your horizons aren't challenged by people. So there is a big social development that we're undergoing. 
the combination of this rapid digital transla- transmission of facts and pictures and money and everything else, and the COVID pandemic. So none of this is predictable. Uh, 10 years from now, looking back on this, we will probably say we didn't realize this was gonna happen. We didn't realize that our summers were gonna be so hot as they have been the last couple of years. We thought maybe there would be some kind of climate change, but it would be in 50 years or more. Instead, it's here with us right now. So the basic message that I have is everything is changing very rapidly. Nashville is a place which is also changing rapidly, which shows that it's flexible to deal with these changes. But for everyone who is either in business or in academia or in government or in the military or whatever, the basic tenets of your world are going to change completely. And if 50 years from now, the world will, not, will look a lot different than it does now. New powers will rise. Old powers will either change or decline. And one of the advantages of the United States is that we, contrary to Europe, we are built on the prospect and, the, in fact, the desire for change. We're always trying to change things in one way or another. Not always positively, but that doesn't matter in this case, because we are a very dynamic society and we will keep up one way or the other. Europe is not a dynamic society. Europe is a mature, and one has to say declining society. And so that means that for the United States, but Europe is also 500 million people more than the United States, with a GNP more than the United States. And for us, it's a very strategic point in the digital world as it has been in the uh, iron and steel world. And so that's why American engagement in Europe is important for us. Not because we want to beat the Russians, not because we think that we owe something to the Europeans, but because Europe is part of our world. And if we were ever to lose Europe from our digital world now, not the, not the real world, not the world of Barbies and McDonald's and blue jeans. If we were to lose them, it would be catastrophic for us. And so that's the reason that um, the Biden administration has put so much effort into Europe. That's the reason why the European Union, which usually seems to be totally disoriented and dis- in, in, in great disagreement, has clicked very rapidly and has gotten very engaged in Ukraine. We would argue maybe they should be more engaged, but leave that aside. The uh, Putin's calculation was probably that the Western world would fall apart because of his invasions. Instead, it has, in fact, fused us closer, more closer together. And much of this is not, it's not just a sense of Europe, not just our desire to maintain a strongly democratic country, Ukraine, but also because of the dynamics of the world, a country such as Ukraine, or also a country such as Germany, are going to be hubs for this new world. And it is very important that we and they uh, stay together because we are the democratic bloc in the world. We're a billion people. Where the, 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 the Atlantic community is about the same size population wise as China, but much larger population wise than China, and, and geographically than China is. We're an Atlantic power, we're a Pacific power, we're a Gulf of Mexico power, we're everything. And so that's why it's important for us to know what's going on in Europe and to know what's going on in Ukraine in particular right now. I hope that they won't be the center of crisis forever, but right now it is. And it's important that we start relating it to the digital world and not necessarily to the world of the past, which is unfortunately, there's the old saying, generals fight the last war. Our our historians and diplomats are also tending to fight the, the, the last war now, and you just need to look at, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but I read it in a magazine such as Foreign Affairs, which is basically filled with articles about the past. And who is trying to push into the future? Our 
our friend, centenarian, if that's the word, centenarian, Henry Kissinger. He has co-authored a book on artificial intelligence. And now, after his 100th birthday, he's going around lecturing on it, artificial intelligence. Because that is the future, and that's going to be something which causes tremendous upheavals. And you can, hardly anyone in the United States would say that we're free of upheavals right now. We have many various upheavals going on. The digital world is not the only cause of these upheavals, but it is one of the major causes. So I think I'll stop right there and uh, be very interested in your questions. And uh, I'm ready to talk about details about Ukraine if you wish. But to me, Ukraine is a symptom of something larger rather than a crisis unto itself. And that's the reason that I tried to talk about the digital world more than about Ukraine. My wife won't be happy with me. She told me yesterday already that nobody knows about that digital stuff. This is all about Ukraine. But uh, it's not all about Ukraine. It's, it's also about uh, how we're going to adapt and how countries such as Russia are either going to adapt or have great difficulty in this new era. I got a question for you. What's the possibility or the forecast for peace or solution to the Ukraine Russia situation? Well, there are no forecasts. I was afraid of that. Uh, and there's also not a clear concept of how we would go for that. I have my own ideas on this. I was, I participated, it's, it seems to be almost by accident, but I was there to surround, I participated in most of the negotiations which led to the end of the Cold War. And also, as uh, uh, Pat mentioned, in the first post-Cold War big negotiation, which was in Bosnia. And my experience is that such conflicts like this, which are deep-rooted in history and society, cannot be solved with a simple peace conference or a dialogue. They have to be solved on the basis of the changes which are taking place or on the, on the deep-rooted changes in the societies. This is the way that the Cold War was ended. The Cold War ended after, we should not forget, 45 to 50 years of military confrontation in which we had staked out the territory and made clear to the Russians that we weren't going to allow them to change this territory. And in the end, they came around. But it was very difficult. As I said, it took 50 years of both confrontation and for realization of what was going on, especially on the part of Europeans, such as the French and the British, who had colonial empires to deal with Portugal, Spain, same thing. So. Right now, I don't see any real prospects for peace, to be honest with you, other than a Ukrainian victory, which causes the Russians to leave the field, which I don't think is going to happen. So there, there are, the answer is zero. There are no chances. That doesn't mean that everybody's not going to be coming forward with peace projects. But my, uh, I work on these things with people in Washington. My recommendation is we strengthen ourselves for the point when peace will be, it will, it will be possible to deal with peace. So I think. Logan is supposed to take over now. <laughs> well, I saw your hand up. You like yeah. to ask a question for uh, me. Yeah. So it seems to me early on that the Ukrainians were masterful in their public relations uh, and the way in which they uh, reached out. But it seems to me that there's some weariness. weariness uh, so some of that's wearing off. Um, and some of the world is perhaps being a little more ambivalent about uh, about uh, about them. Uh, is that because they've lost the infrastructure to do that, or is it simply that war is mean and nasty, and sometimes you have to be as mean and nasty as you're? Yeah, I think it's the latter. The infrastructure is there. There's the continuous debates going on about what sort of weapons we should send to Ukraine, but leave that, leave that aside, because we've sent a lot. They wouldn't be still fighting if it weren't for the weapons that especially the United States has sent. But people get tired of things. Now again, I'm, I've been around a while. I can't tell you that I was active during the Korean War, but I remember the Korean War. Or uh, you take another example, Afghanistan. We're both in Afghanistan, both the Americans and the Russians 
determined after years of fighting and sacrifice that it simply wasn't worth it. So we just walked away. I, as a former diplomat, thought that was a very bad solution to Afghanistan, but it was the only one that could have been uh, conceived at that time. Same with the Korean War. Eisenhower ran on the ticket, the Republican ticket, and he sort of chose one out of a hat, I think. He, he was very apolitical, but his basic campaign promise was, I'm going to end the Korean War. And he, what he did, very shortly, six months or so after he was elected, was go to Korea and just say, okay, we stop. And the armistice, the so-called armistice, as we know, uh, it's a bit in the news this morning because of an American soldier who went over the line, has been frozen there since 1953. And, uh, you know, we don't like it. The Chinese like it, that's why they keep North Korea going, I suppose. But uh, in the meantime, South Korea has uh, developed into one of the world's leading industrial nations. So um, we'll just have to wait and see. It's not, it's not, right now it wouldn't be possible because the only way that we could stop the fighting right now would be for the West to accept a frozen conflict with the Russians occupying X percent, I don't know what it is, of Ukrainian territory, including Crimea. And that wouldn't be possible. And, if, and, and it's not just because we want to be nice to the Ukrainians. If, if the, that sort of solution were achieved, you'd have a new president in Ukraine very rapidly. You would have upheaval in Ukraine. You would probably have two or three million more refugees coming out of Ukraine to get to the West because they wouldn't trust the security that was provided more or less by the, you know, more or less by the United States actually. They wouldn't trust that anymore. So we're really in the proverbial rock and a hard place at the moment. The war is, people are getting tired of the war. The United States is spending billions on it, much of it, by the way, of emptying our warehouses of old equipment that we're going to be scrapped anyway. But uh, we have been truly engaged in our, in our help. Europe has maintained its unity on this. But how long? You know, sooner or later in democracies, people get tired. Your question is very good. And um, I think that fatigue is starting to be seen already. And that's why, for me, I, and you can see the way I structured our discussion this morning, it's very important to understand that this is not just about Ukraine. This is about the future of this new world that we're in. And uh, it's going to be, uh, whatever happens in Ukraine, it's going to be a very dangerous and difficult change. And the territory on which Ukraine sits, which is, by the way, the largest country other than Russia, which is a, a Eurasian country, the country as we know, the largest country of Europe as, as Europe is Ukraine in land, in land uh, uh, territory. So um, I'm sorry, I can't be more positive, but it, it really is uh, your, 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 your Intuition is correct. People are going to get tired of this probably fairly rapidly. We do have a presidential election coming up after all. And, it's, and you can be sure that it's, and it's this one sentence on that, it's very difficult for the Republicans because on the one hand, we know it's difficult for them because of the former president. But secondly, becoming involved in something like Ukraine is basically a Republican kind of policy. And so it's very hard for them to try and do, to, negotiate the differences between public frustration with such things and their their uh, traditional point of view. Well, thank you for that. <clears throat> um, I do have one question for you to start with. Beginning, yeah. you're talking about the, the new world and the digital new world. And with any new world, you need a foundation to launch into it. And that foundation today is data. And you've spoken a bit about that. And so what you have spoken in the past is that the currency of the new digital world will be the production, evaluation, and application of data. Could you go more in depth about that? Yeah, well, I was born and grew up in Detroit, an automobile city. And by the way, Ford, I actually lived in the city of Dearborn where our, one of our 
compatriots with a guy called Henry Ford, and he was pretty successful in business. And they are now building an immense battery plant in, the, in West Tennessee. Uh, and uh, you can see that um, the, the entire automobile industry is changing, but also the geography, this is the point I was making before, the geography of industries, but also the geography of governments is changing very rapidly toward to this to this digital maps, I would say. And what I have been arguing to people is we need to learn how to make digital maps in our heads or on paper. And it's, that's not done very often. We're still using the old maps. And the old maps are useful because they show you where people live and who lives where and et cetera, et cetera. But the new maps are more important and you, you I quoted, I think, something that I had written somewhere that, that the new maps are important because they show companies, governments, scholars, but also normal people, what things are infecting, affecting their lives. And um, there was a word that, which is a very useful and long-term word in industry global supply chains. That became almost a household word during the COVID epidemic. Because, and you, you saw on TV pictures of the port of Long Beach in California with 200 ships out there waiting to be unloaded, etc. Because it wasn't because we had bad relations with China, which we still have actually very positive trade relations with China. It wasn't because there were strikes, it wasn't because of anything, it was because the digital supply chain had been broken. And this is the kind of, these are the kinds of things which are going to be important for both for industry, and but also for diplomacy and for military uh, action in the future. It's gonna be based on different criteria. And so that's, that's why I think they come together very clearly. And with that, I know that um, AI is a huge topic right now, and in my um, research in grad school, I realized that AI is about data, as we mentioned right. before, and it's about how it's used and how it's it's filtered, structured, and um, basically used to cause predictions. Right. It's not good at judgments, so it requires people to be good at judgments, and AI is good at prediction. How do you see the EU? with their stringent um, data privacy and acts that they've enacted the past couple of years. Are they in tandem with how people view AI in the US government now, or is that a fault line between us? Well, it's both. Um, on the one hand, the digital infrastructure in Europe is what? I don't know the exact figure, but let's just say 90% in American hands. Europeans don't know this because they don't pay much attention to digital things. It's probably good they don't know it. Uh, but um, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Apple, all have immense investments. One of the best investments in Germany, which I know better than other countries in recent years, has been warehouses. When I get rich, get, get yourself a warehouse. Because uh, Amazon has been chewing up territory for warehouses for its aptly named uh, fulfillment centers. Fulfillment for Jeff Bezos' pockets, basically. Uh, but uh, there, there are, and the other big warehouse-like activity which has been going on is uh, Google and Microsoft building immense, immense, immense data centers. So there you get your connection. Um, the world is not, can never become totally digital because you have that, as they, some people say in the, in, the, in the field, that last mile that has to be done by a delivery truck. And we all know that these, we all see these Amazon trucks around but yesterday there was a solution of a threatened strike, which was almost as important as the movie star strike with UPS. 
and if UPS and FedEx and the U.S. Post Office went out of business or went on strike, the whole economy would come to an end. It's all, we're already so digitalized that it would come to an end, but at the end, and that's why this is, again, so very interesting also for businesses today. In the end, you have people who have to have something in their minds, or in their heads, or in their hands. And that means somebody's going to get into a truck and bring your, you know, your marijuana pills or whatever you're ordering um, to your house. And so it is a combination of both. Now, the question about Europe. Europe is not as I said earlier, a forward-looking place. It, it suffers, I've written, in fact, long articles on this, it suffers from a sort of cultural PTSD. And one can understand it, one can be sympathetic to it, but one cannot accept it as the basis for our own behavior. And uh, my experience over the now many years has been that Things moved forward in Europe only when the United States became the catalyst for the change, either by strong political military engagement or because we so disrupt them that they feel that they have to react to us. Now, this is what's in the digital world. Europeans who, who regulate themselves considerably more than we do because they live so tightly packed together have decided to declare themselves as a regulatory power in the digital world. Now that's self-defeating because regulators are usually not the ones who innovate. They, in fact, try and control innovation, in many cases, maybe in most cases, for the well-being of the people, but it's still a backward-looking conservative approach. And that's what Europe is doing in the meantime. I mean, the United States is just roaring ahead. You do not hear about any European developers of AI, for example. There are lots of committees in Germany. The Germans love of established committees. There are lots of committees. There are lots of institutes in all kinds of countries to, to study AI. But no entrepreneurs have taken it to market. And that's the major difference between the United States and Europe. Um, I actually founded an organization 10 years ago this year in Germany called the John F. Kennedy Atlantic Forum. And its goal was to discuss entrepreneurship among younger people. Well, we had a good start, as is usually the case with these things, but after about five years, nobody was interested anymore. They just weren't interested in talking about entrepreneurship. And, and ultimately, we just closed the place down because it was, uh, it was too hard to try and get both funding and participants. So there's the difference between the United States and Europe. Uh, Europe is, want to be the regulatory power, and we don't know what we want to be, but we end up always being the, the, the dynamic, innovative power. Yeah. One final point. This is a, a, a town that was declared the hit city 10 years ago, and it's still booming just that way. Um, it's massive in construction here, and construction is really built upon data, and there's a massive um, medical uh, influence here in Nashville as well, and so data is a big problem for both of them. If you're gonna to look to the future in the digital new world, this is a different question I would assume than most, but can data be sold as a commodity? Well, that's what Bitcoin is trying to do, isn't it? And, but it, and it, it can be, or you can buy stock in Microsoft or, or NVIDIA, which is the, 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 the prettiest girl in the dance at the moment. Everybody wants to own NVIDIA stocks. And what does NVIDIA sell? They sell data processing, basically. Individuals selling data one to another, in a sense, in the same way stocks can be sold in between. Well, you know, again, this is all open. There is a, there is a, already a branch of industry, shall we call it, which I find myself totally incomprehensible, and that is people are willing to spend tens of thousands of dollars for digital art. And what NFTs. Do you, excuse me? NFTs. Yeah. And what do you get? You get a, I don't know, a password or whatever, whatever do you really get. And then you can look at this thing and say, hey, there's my picture that I bought. 
Um, but you can't actually put that on your wall unless you have a, have a TV screen or something to put it on your wall. So, yeah, I mean, that's what's happening. And, and, um, and uh, the um, a country, a company like IBM, which was one of the great innovators of American industry for many, many years, the head of IBM, his first thing he did was say he was going to fire 50,000 people because AI made them redundant. But secondly, IBM has been struggling for the last 20 or so years to redefine itself for a digital world that really hasn't done that well. It's been passed. Uh, things changed. I mean, I, I mentioned that I was uh, born and grew up in, the, in, the, in Michigan, in the Detroit area. In the 20th century, Detroit was essentially the Silicon Valley of the, you know, of the, of the Iron and Steel Age. Many, many things were invented there. And uh, many, many things were produced there. And then all of a sudden, it was over. And Detroit dropped from me having a million and a half people down to having 600,000 people. And if you go through some of the neighborhoods in Detroit, which used to be beautifully green and leafy, you see nothing but abandoned houses. Uh, Detroit is a very good example of what the digital age could be. Natural is the city now. Silicon Valley has been the center of innovation for 20, 25 years. That could change very rapidly. And uh, you know, people are already talking about what the next chapter is. The next chapter is, according to the experts anyway, I don't know who, I don't know, I don't know bioengineering. And then it will make a lot of these companies in uh, Silicon Valley not redundant, but seriously not as dynamic as they are now. Great, and then we have a question back there. Yeah, dude, um, Europe uh, is seeing a lot of changes. Germany today is in a recession, and their green policy has, has kind of backfired on them. Do you see that happening here as well, or are we going to stay out of that problem? Well, I just, as I said, I've just spent 20 years working in industry in Germany, and I could give you a long discourse on what I think about that. But essentially, it's the same problem again. First place, Germany. Why shouldn't Germany be in a recession? It's been booming along for the last 20 years. And um, so my first point here would be to warn everybody to not take too seriously the reports that you're getting from Germany, because they are Europeans, and especially Germans are, as I said, a stability-based, backward-looking society. And so they tend to be very pessimistic. And I wrote an email to a friend yesterday and said, when the Germans become pessimistic, you know that they're getting ready to change. It's when they're, opti it's when they're optimistic that worries you. <laughs> and uh, I would still use that phrase. Europe is a tremendous place. It's a tre not just a place of nice castles and mountains and things. It has tremendous industrial base, unbelievable, and an even greater intellectual property base. But it doesn't, it, they are not first adapters, let's put it, uh, adopters, I guess is the word, not adapters. They're not for, f first adopters. They come along afterwards and, uh, and uh, make good products, et cetera, et cetera, but they come along afterwards. Germany is different. We, would, I don't know, this, we have our, our resident German expert, Doug Berry, here. We could have a long, long discussion of Germany, but I would just say that I, as part of what I was doing for Accenture, I developed a, a schematic of what I thought the new world order was going to be like, and I actually did a, held a series of seminars in Berlin on this. And my new big powers for the next era of history are obviously the United States, obviously China, and the third one is not Europe, but Germany. As Germany will, will have a future which is different from the rest of Europe for a whole lot of reasons. It's geographic position, it's intellectual base, it's industrial base, it's focus on quality, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I have experienced this myself a couple of times in all the years I've been living there. Um, they are often written off as being, in fact, in 2005 and six, they were called the sick man of Europe. Not the sick they of Europe, but the sick, the sick man of Europe. And five years later, they were moving along as the uh, dynamic motor of Europe. Jimmy Carter and Helmut Schmidt had a major uh, um, confrontation 
over Jimmy Carter's desire for Europe, for Germany to be the motor of the world economy. And Helmut Schmidt said, uh, I'm not a motor of anything. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, this is why uh, when you hear pessimism about Germany, it's basically a good sign because it shows that they're finally try, uh, trying to adapt to what's happening. <laughs> All right, we have time for one more. That's good. Um, thank you so very much, and thank you so much for coming today. Please don't forget to, um, if you haven't, become a member for the Tennessee World Affairs Council. And thank you again for your time. It was a lot to unpack and a lot to go through, so thank you. Well, for doing thank it. you very much for uh, uh,